Good evening, and welcome to this week in review. Tonight's stories include Demonstration a Great Success, Interview with Government Officials, Lions Annual Speaker. These stories plus community events, the BBS Playbill, Off the Rack, and more coming up after this. Six months ago, she didn't know what kidney disease was. Today, it affects every aspect of her life. Hours of dialysis don't leave much time for bedtime stories. She misses weekend camping trips. She misses family pizza night. And her daughter misses them too. Through research and patient services, the Kidney Foundation is helping to create a better life for patients and their families. On Wednesday of this week, the demonstration went ahead as planned. At approximately 10.45 a.m., the residents started to gather at the town hall to show their support for our town council as they went into meetings with government officials. This time, the waiting paid off. Most of the students from both schools decided to come along and add their support with the rest of the town. Many of the elementary school students carried their own signs. Most of the signs echoed the same thoughts as most of the adults. At 11.30 a.m., the elementary school teachers decided to take their students back to school because of the cold temperatures, but not before they put their signs in the snowbank. Five minutes later, our MHA, Calvin Parsons, along with new Minister of Fisheries, Jerry Reed, and Minister of Municipal Affairs, Oliver Langlin, arrived. <laughs> They spoke to the crowd before going into their meetings. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a good morning. It's almost afternoon now, I guess. And thanks very, very much for your show of support and solidarity this morning. It does us all good that your local politicians, that's the town council, and those who've come in this morning as we go about to once again try to reactivate our plan and, and come up with some, some ideas. I thank you very, very much, and I certainly do, on behalf of the Burgio Town Council and the new people, the people of Burgio, welcome Minister Reed and, and Minister Langdon in their new portfolios as Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture and Minister of Municipal Affairs. And I also thank our own Minister, Minister Parsons, who arranged that they would visit our town early in their new tenure. So I would like for you all to give them a nice big hurrah of welcome. I think the message which you want to pass on here today has been passed on. The best ones are over there, which the children which lift have put in the snowbank for them. I think it says it all. 
And I want to ask you now to give me and pass on to them what you want. And what do you want? Yeah. When do you want it? Now! Yeah. Where do you want it? Yeah. I think that's loud and clear. And I hope this is the last time that I've got a call on you to come out and support us in this way. Let's hope that this is the last time and that something good will come out of this. And I want to explain to some of them that the ribbons you see here today are being carried by those who've got people uh, gone away to get there to work or else they're, they're representative of, of those who have had to go away and have come back. One person told me this morning, he had, I don't know how many ribbons on his pole, he said, I got those many here now. That's for the number of times I've got to go away before I reach my retirement. Hopefully that this can be turned around and our town will once again, and I don't want to use that phrase that Mr. Pickford used, but I think we all know it, that the sun will shine again. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hand, ladies and gentlemen, students. It is certainly nice to be here. I've made no bones about where I stand with Virgil in my district here, and that the plant opening in Virgil was from day one my number one commitment. It still is my number one commitment, regardless of who the leader is, and I know that's been an issue. Regardless, my concern here is to make sure that the people who have any say into the opening of the Virgil plant are informed about what the problem is, knows what you people are going through, so they can either stand with us or stand against us. And I can assure you that both of these gentlemen here, particularly Minister Reed, he may be new as a minister of fisheries, but he's not new to understanding the fisheries. He's been at this racket for a long time, and he was the executive assistant to the former minister, Walter Carter, for some years as well. So I'm pleased to see that even before he got sworn in, I made it clear to him that I'd like him to come to Virgil so that he could see face-to-face -face the people who are affected by this plant not being opened. So he can have an appreciation of it firsthand with his own eyes and I want his full backing and support in whatever we have to do to get this plant open again. Right on. Right on. Now we've been working on this along with Mayor Han and of course there's the union committee. We've been working on this for the past two years and we thought we found a silver bullet in the fall of 99 when this plant opened with the exploratory crab. But unfortunately that bullet didn't take us where we need to go. So I'm not a quitter. I don't intend to quit, and whoever we've got to touch to make sure that this happens, we're going to touch. I know the Glen Ann's of the world who go off to work in fish plants and PEI, and, and the people here who go to pick apples. Well, that's just not good enough. And don't any of you think for a moment that I think it's good enough, because it's not. And if I, as I say, I have one job, one priority in this job, is to get that plan open. And I'll do and talk to and twist whatever arms it takes to do that. We already had extensive meetings last week, Monday in Corner Brook, the, with the Fish Plant Committee. I know the zone is here this morning, and Harvey and Cyril. We had meetings last week. There will be no doubt further meetings and follow-up from that one. And Mayor Han here as well is also involved in continuing to promote the cause of Virgil. He's going to be leaving here to go to a fisheries forum this weekend in Gander to promote it again with the Federation of Municipalities. So no matter how much downtime we've had, how frustrating this is, we cannot quit. And I appreciate here to see the crowd that came out here to let the Minister of Fisheries know that you are good, normal human beings who want to do nothing but work and work in your own community. And I can assure you, and I can assure you he's here today so that there is no stone left unturned in terms of him understanding the issue. I feel already he has a good understanding of it, but he wanted to hear himself from the mayor and from the council and from the committee exactly what the issues are to make sure he fully understands it. And I have no doubt that when this, when this meetings are over today, he will be fully informed and he will be a supporter of whatever we have to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Uh, Mayor, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, students, I'm uh, happy that you came out here today and I'm also happy to be here. Uh, just prior to being sworn in at Government House two weeks ago, Calvin asked me if I would come to Burgio 
and meet with the uh, with the action committee and the council here and I agreed even before I was sworn in the first thing that I said when being interviewed by the fisheries broadcast five minutes after I was sworn in that it was going to go to Bergio and Ramia unfortunately we couldn't get here last week but I gave the commitment that I would come and this is the first meeting that I've held since becoming Minister of Fisheries. I haven't even been back to my own district for meetings since I was sworn in. Uh, as Calvin said, I'm new to the position, but I'm not really new to the department. I worked there from 1989 until 1996, and as you know, what happened during that time is the reason we're here today. The fishery closed in 1992, and this plant has seen very little work since then. I have three in my own district in the same situation. Now some of the factors involved here are somewhat beyond control of the provincial government and what I mean by that is the quotas that would be needed or that would certainly help to get this plant open. We're talking about uh, shrimp and crab from the offshore. I'm going to be meeting with the federal minister uh, in the next few weeks and I will certainly bring this plant and the one in Ramio, your, your concerns over these two plants to Mr. Dollywall when I meet with him. I'm here today to listen to the mayor and the committees here to see what you have to say and I can only give you one commitment ladies and gentlemen and that is that I will do everything in my power to ensure that your fish plant is opened and open as soon as possible. Right now that's the best I can do for you. I'm willing to go to work with your member to ensure that we get that fish plant open. So again, I thank you for coming here today, and I hope that we have good meetings, and I hope that I might be able to come back here in a few months and see this plant open and the people here back to work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give him a good shot, boys. Give him a good shot. We had an opportunity to speak with these government officials before they left town. Good afternoon, gentlemen. And thanks very much for speaking with me. First of all, can you give us a summary of your meeting with the town? Okay. The uh, first issue in the town's play, of course, was the fish plant itself. We have uh, there's a committee that's struck by the union to uh, to discuss the plant issues, but the town has been involved in the plant issues for many many years. Uh, particularly Alistair, who's ended up much of the negotiations between the provincial, federal, and union. My purpose today of being here was to invite Jerry Reed, who's the new Minister of uh, Fisheries and Agriculture, to come in so that he could have a first-hand understanding of the problem in Virgil regarding the plant being closed. I briefed him, of course, on some of the background issue before we ever got here. He's been involved in the fisheries himself for many, many years. He was an EA to Walter Carter, who was the Minister of Fisheries from uh, 1989 to 1996, and he's been parliamentary assistant to John Effort, uh, or to Ian Talk, who took over the position, and now he's the minister himself. So he has a lot of information and knowledge about the fishery, but I wanted him to have a first-hand understanding from the town as to the problem we have here in Virgil with this plant, and of course to support and secure his support for whatever we had to do from the province to get this plant open again. And we, I'm pleased to say that he's wholeheartedly endorsed that he will do whatever he can to assist us in getting that plant reactivated. Okay. Now, that's all well and good, but was there any news or hope within the next four or five months that the plant is going to be open? There's nothing definitive. It's a complicated procedure. Besides this meeting with the town we had, I made mention of the fact that there's a union committee. The union committee and myself and Bill Matthews and Bill Berry and Rich Anstey of the FFAW and uh, Max Short, who was a representative of Dollywall, met in Corner Brook on Monday the 19th, and uh, we had an extensive meeting to come up with possible options for the Virgil plant, whether it be crab, whether it be shrimp, whether it be some other kind of fish product. And uh, we concluded that meeting with Mr. Berry saying that he would provide us with a proposal of what he thought the various options might be that might be workable and to point out the role that each government should have in those options. So that's where we are now. We've had that meeting, we're about 10 days away from that meeting, and uh, we expect to have that proposal from him so that we can discuss it in detail with the union committee and, and see where we go from here. Because obviously, the union and Bill Berry, who's the owner of the plant over there, and the possessor of the license, are two of the biggest stakeholders as to where we're going to go with that plant. So 
So we need everybody on side from their perspective, and of course we need both levels of government, the provincial government and the federal government. And the Bill Matthews was there to say that, that he would do whatever he could, and I was there to say that I would do whatever I could, and now I'm very pleased to say that the Minister of Fisheries for this province is endorsing that stand and saying that we will do together, and the Cabinet and the Ministers, whatever we have to do to get this plan off of it from oh. a provincial perspective. Okay, now um, from a resident's perspective and from um, the perspective of those people that were standing in front of the town hall, they're sick of meetings, they're sick of demonstrations, they're sick of public forums, public meetings, discussing where do we go from here, they want to see action. Now as the new Minister of Fishery, can you do anything different or new, bring something new to the table that hasn't been done before? Well, as Calvin said, I, I might be new as the Minister, but I'm not new to Department of Fisheries. I visited this plant, I think, in 1989 with Walter Carter when the plant was in operation. The problem that we have in this plant is that we don't have a product right now. Next year, there's, there's, there's talks already that there's going to be a crab cut, or a cut to the quota of crab on the east coast of Newfoundland. So, I mean, with further cuts to crab, I think our hope, and the hope for the residents of Bergio, lies with the Federal Minister of Fisheries. That's not saying that I'm shirking my responsibilities. I think what we need in, in, in Bergio is an offshore allocation of shrimp and crab, both or separately. And, I, and there was a deal almost worked last year, or the year before, to that, to that end. But we need a product. And I'll be meeting with my federal counterpart in a couple of weeks. I think he's off to New Zealand now for the next two weeks. But when I meet with him, and I'll be meeting with others in the meantime, to discuss what we can do with Bergio. I told the, uh, the council here today that uh, last year I, I met with the residents of Fogo, Fogo Island, to discuss an allocation of shrimp to Fogo Island. We got that. But all the while we were talking in that meeting, we met with Max Short, who worked with the federal minister at the time, all the while we were in that meeting. He talked about having to do something for Bergio. And we left the meeting thinking that if there's any allocations, it's coming to Bergio. Because, I mean, there was an effort, there's no doubt about it. The federal member was involved, the union was involved, and uh, the, the member, and I thought that we were going to be able to do something for Bergio. I mean, I th look, when I go next week, here's what it's all about. Look, some elementary school students said it, right? Open the plant. I don't want my dad to move away or to go away. I mean, that sums it up. Basically, what the people of Virgil want. They want to go to work. They're used to having, having work 12 months a year when that fish plant was open down here. And that's what we have to try to do. I will make the strongest representation that I can to the federal minister because maybe down the road the fish stocks could come back. There might be other species that we could fish on the south coast of Newfoundland. But right now, I think I would be lying if I said there was anything else that we could do. We need, right now, for this town, an offshore allocation of shrimp or crab, because I don't think there's enough crab around the coast of Newfoundland right now, with the possibility of quota cuts, to, uh, to supply this fish plant, given the geographic location. It was tried in Ramia two years ago, bringing, bringing crab from the east coast. It didn't really work, did it all? didn't really work. The company is no longer operating. So I think our best chance is an allocation, an offshore allocation, shrimp or crab or both. And I will be pursuing that with the federal minister. It looks like there's going to be an increase in the, in the uh, total level cash for shrimp this coming season. And rather than prorate that over the existing license holders, some of which, or some of whom are located in Nova Scotia, PEI, Quebec, and New Brunswick, I think that the federal minister should say, let's make a case for Virgil. And I would, be, I would fully support that, because okay. it is an area of the province that needs that. And I mean, on a regional basis, I mean, this is one of the areas that we should be looking at. And that's the reason that this is my first stop as Minister of Fisheries for this province. And I gave that commitment to, the, to the, uh, your member here the morning that we were being sworn in into cabinet, and five minutes later I was on the fisheries broadcast telling the people of Virgil that I was coming. Unfortunately, we couldn't get here last week. But I will do everything in my power, along with your member, to try to correct the problem that we have there.
but we have to find a product. Okay, now you, you uh, stated that uh, there was probably an offshore shrimp quota along with some crab. Now, is there a possibility that uh, Bergio might be duped as it was there back in October where they says, uh, we got some crab, it was about 10 weeks, and it was a test fishery. And when January rolled around, the quotas was caught because they were claiming that the offshore crab was the same, uh, I know. same as the inshore crab. Unfortunately, some things happened, uh, happened with that that was beyond control, I think, of the provincial government at the time. Am I right to go? Yes, we thought we had the silver bullet in, in the fall of 99 when we got so much crab coming here from the, uh, from the exploratory. I mean, Barry had gear on the plant to work here. We went to St. John's. We had our do down at the battery. I mean, I was there along with Alistair and the rest of us and Oliver who fought to have that buck brought up here to the south coast. We thought we had won that back when, when 2,000 quotas came out that we'd be off and running. We thought we had the problem solved. Bill Barry didn't stick millions of dollars in this plant over here on a whim thinking that we wouldn't have it solved. Out comes to 2,000 quotas and it got cut. And when it's cut, the rule is last in, first out. So Virgil being the last in to the crab fishery, Virgil was the first out. And it looks like again this year, I mean, at the meeting that we had last week with, with all the stakeholders, it seems pretty evident that crab may be cut even further again this year. So we have to be practical that if we didn't get it last year when there was a cut, and if there's going to be a further cut, it doesn't look like we're in 2001 going to get any crab. So if that's the case, where else do we look? We still need an offshore allocation, and as the minister says, it looks like there's going to be an increase in shrimp. The question is, what use can we make, or what use can Mr. Barry make of shrimp? Because this plant over here now is geared up to process crab. So even if there is a shrimp increase, and even if we're fortunate enough to have Mr. Daliwa saying we can have some of the shrimp, we then had to get into the practical discussions with Mr. Barry again. Can you make use of that shrimp in some way? Can it be processed here? Can it be sold in the water as they've done in the PEI situation and use the money to, to cross-subsidize something else that we might be able to do here. So it's a complicated situation, but the first necessary step is to get that offshore allocation, whether it be crab, whether it be shrimp, whatever it may be, we at least need the resource first, because if we don't have a resource, we don't get off step one. Okay. See, I've, I've got a, a similar problem in, in my own right, in Twingate. For example, Twingate had a, had got a crab license in 1997. And the, the, the plant has operated for a half a season since 1992 when the moratorium went in effect. But the problem in Twillingate is not, is not the same as the problem in, in Bergio. As last year, uh, 8 million pounds of product was lathered at the wharf in Twillingate by people who live in the area and was trucked out to various places in the province. I mean, you don't, you just imagine if you were sitting here today and watching 8 million pounds of product landed on the wharf in Bergio, and trucked around this island. That's what I'm dealing with in my own district. So even though they didn't get any work, they have a, a different circumstance than you have here. And that's why I'm saying that we need an offshore allocation more than anything. That would be the ideal situation. Because as Calvin said, even if, 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 if the current owners had an allocation of shrimp, they could sell that in the water. That's, what, what, that's what's happening to most of the offshore shrimp. It's being sold in the water, but with the proceeds from that sale, you could subsidize other fisheries or other processing here. You see, with the uh, geography, the geographical region that we find, Bergio and Ramey, you know, these communities that we represent here is going to live or die depending on the, the sea. And if we're not successful in getting a particular quota whereby we can operate the plant, then the communities are in for a rough ride. So in that sense, that's why we, Calvin and I and the minister here are working as hard as we can to ensure that we can get a quota so that we can activate these plants and, and as a result of that, keep the community viable. And uh, it's not easy to, to do, but nevertheless, we have to work toward make that happen so that, as I said, that people can remain here and work here. Okay. Um, how about the uh, new leader of the Liberal Party and our Premier, Mr. Grimes? Do you have his full backing? Apparently, um, now this is just rumor, I have no idea if this is true or not, but rumor has it that Mr. Grimes was heard saying that the rural communities on the coast are dying, let them die. So if I, that's I, the case... No, I'd like to address that comment because <coughs> I've heard that myself here, and I've had several people in Virgil call me about it, 
uh, one in particular being Glenn Hand, who was very concerned to hear it, and I was concerned to hear that he said it that way. Well, we all would be because that's pretty much our new flag. The actual, the first comment, heard of the that actual that. comment was made by Roger Grimes as a leadership candidate when he was in the district. Uh, Walter Knowles District of Virginia Park and met with the executive there. There was a man there who had relatives in Virgil, I believe his name is Jack Cossar. And in the course of the questioning, uh, Mr. Cossar asked Roger Grimes what was his position regarding rural Newfoundland. And he listed off a bunch of communities, and he listed several communities which included Virgil. And his response were that if we don't do something as a government, there are communities in Newfoundland that are going to die. So. What he actually said and what has been interpreted to what he said is two different things. Roger Grimes represents a rural district himself. Roger Grimes has fishing communities in his district the same as we all have fishing communities in our districts. Roger Grimes, of anybody we have had as a premier in this province since the days of Joey Smallwood, is a full, positive, absolute backer of the survival of rural Newfoundland. We have no hesitation in saying, and I have absolutely no hesitation in saying, that Roger Grimes is going to be the first guy to knock on whatever doors we need knocked on to get this problem here in Virgil solved. I, I could never support a person who said that we would let Rural Newfoundland die. I mean, that's absolutely ludicrous. I don't think, I, I, I've never heard, this is the first time I heard the comment actually. So I certainly don't think that that, that would be the way that the uh, Andrew Grimes and, would think. And, uh, my and district is absolutely yeah. rural and, uh, and, mine, uh, and all of us here. And I make no bones about it. Uh, I went back and sought clarification when I heard that because, number one, it astounded me that a man would even say that coming from a rural district himself. He doesn't represent the St. John's district. He represents a rural, rural Newfoundland. His district is exploits, which has fishing communities. And when I asked him about it, he said, look, absolutely not. My comment was that if we don't do stuff, yes, the town of Virgil and the town of many other towns will die if we don't do something to make them survive. And that's what the challenge is to us. And the challenge he said to him as a premier is to see if we can make them survive. Okay, so you do have total backing up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Um, now, this is an unrelated subject. Um, how did you enjoy a ride over Virgil Road? It was pretty stormy today. Uh, there was a lot of snow uh, bumps along the way, a lot of blowovers. And in the fact, they tell us now we're just about to leave. We've been here all day having meetings. And uh, Doug Kendall tells us that it's not looking very good to get back out. So okay. uh, we may get a tractor to, to help us or whatever, but uh, hopefully we'll get back out safely. No. Well, uh, Mr. We, exper we experienced the same thing on the bed, on the uh, yeah. highway, so it's no uh, stranger to us. Now you are the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs. That's right. And what I'm about to ask is probably unrelated to you. But in his uh, council report recently, Mayor Ann stated that the uh, Department of Works, Services and Transportation says no, they will not paint the white lines on the Burgio Highway because traffic is not as heavy as it should be. Now, uh, given the fact that you came in over the Burgio Road today and you got a little bit of taste of what our weather was, can you put in a plug for us when you go in St. John's to the proper people and say, look, those people need those white lines to get home safely in fog and snow? Certainly will. I'll talk to the uh, Minister of Transportation, newly appointed Minister Percy Barrett, good friend of mine, and I will tell him exactly the words that you said. Thank you very much. I will do that. And any, anybody else have any comment they'd like to make before I'd, we go? I'd just like to say as a new minister, I would really appreciate uh, having come here today. Uh, I realize the problems that you have here, and I would like nothing more than be able to help you solve those. As you said, you're sick of, of talking. There would be nothing I would like more. You would walk into this room and look into this camera and say, we have a solution for your problem here in Virgio, and say to these kids, no, your fathers are not going to have to go away to go to work. That would, that's my goal, and I hope that I can accomplish it. Okay, so we can expect to hear you guys on the news uh, ranting and raving about Virgio and your districts to get I, some plants open. Uh, I don't know. If I'm, I'm not one of these ranting and raving <laughs> type individuals. When I ran for the nomination of the Liberal Party in Fogel Island, uh, Back in 1996, there was a reporter there just like yourself. And at the end of it, she wrote a little story, and I read it in the, in, it's called the Fogel Island Flyer, and she said, Mr. Reed seems to be quiet and shy and everything, and I wonder, she said, will his bite be bigger than his bark? At the, that's what she said in the article. I bet though, if you asked her today, having done what I've done for that district in the last five years, because I'll place my record, 
up against anyone in government in the last five years, I bet you she would say today that my bite is far bigger than my bar. But if that's what it takes to rattle some chains, rattle some cages in Ottawa, I can get down there with the best of them and do it. No, we certainly look forward to hearing you and seeing some results. Thank you very much. Here. I appreciate the ministers coming into town. A lot of times people see these individuals on TV, they know that the decisions that they make affect their lives, and they want to know that they have the assurances and protection and support from these people. And uh, Minister Langdon and Minister Reid coming here today, if anything, should show the people of Burgio that they're there, they are supportive of them, and they will help me do whatever has to be done to get this town back to where it ought to be. There's been a lot of negativity in the last couple of months. A lot of it is attributable to the recent Liberal Leadership Convention and what happened there and who chose to support whom in the Liberal Leadership. I made my decisions for the reasons that I had. I don't feel that I made the wrong decisions at all. I know that ultimately we need a Minister of Fisheries here and we need a Premier in this province who is going to support Virgil. What name that person carries matters not to me. What matters to me is do we have somebody there who's got the gumption and the guts to do what's necessary for the town of Virgil. And rest assured, the same as I told the people here this morning who were protesting or, or showing their concern would be more appropriate, we're on their side. There's nobody here today that is not here to put in a plug and tow on the same rope that Virgil got to tow on itself. So let there be no misunderstanding about where I stand. I will talk to whomever I had to, speak to whomever I had to, screech at whoever I had to, wherever it is necessary to get done what we had to do for the people of Virgil. Okay, thank you very much for talking. Thank you. On Wednesday of this week, the Virgil Lions Club held their annual speak out at the community center. After a soup and sandwich supper, MC for the event, Lion Max Pink got the event started. Five level two students took part, beginning with speaker number one, Dana Pink. Good evening, Lions, Lioness, judges, contestants, ladies and gentlemen. In March of 1997, a scientific milestone was announced. This milestone, however, went beyond science and reached into the homes of people all over the world. The announcement on March 5, 1997, introduced the first ever mammal that had been cloned using adult cells. This process brought about many questions concerning ethics and questions about how far this new world could take us. Four years later, we have come a little closer to discovering the answers to our questions. Some of these answers came about as a result of an experiment conducted at the Oregon Regional Primate Research Center, where the first transgenic primate was created. This rhesus monkey, named Andy, was born with the gene of a jellyfish. This jellyfish gene had been inserted into a virus that had then been used to infect 224 monkey eggs. These eggs were fertilized in test tubes, resulting in 126 embryos. Only three baby monkeys were born alive, and only one, Andy, carried the extra gene throughout his body. Benjamin Vatcher was the next to speak. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I would like to speak about professional athletes. More specifically, I would like to discuss whether or not professional athletes deserve the millions of dollars they receive each year. Recently, many of you may have heard about Alex Rodriguez's $252 million deal. Or perhaps it was Tiger Woods that caught your attention. But, perhaps, but regardless of your favorite sport or your favorite players, I'm sure that you have all heard about at least one of the many million dollar contracts that are out there. Everyone knows that professional athletes are making big bucks. But does anybody know for sure and can justify whether or not they are working? For example, during the 1996 season, Michael Jordan made an average of $160 a second. That's more than some employees made in a full 25 hour work week. That same year, Jordan made an average of $170,000 a day. Speaker number three was Julia Bellard. Good evening, Lions, Lioness, judges, parents, and fellow speakers. 
Tonight, I have chosen to speak on the social implications that AIDS victims face. It is hard to comprehend that as the human race advances forward into the new millennium, there will be close to 35 million people worldwide infected with AIDS. Every day is a struggle for those infected with this virus. Will the cure be found? How does society deal with, these, with this virus? And how does acceptance or lack of acceptance change in the future? AIDS, or acquired immune deficiency syndrome, is caused by a virus called HIV. It is hard to believe that such a small virus could have such a dramatic effect on society. The AIDS epidemic first appeared in the United States in the spring of 1981, when young men started to become ill with what was known at the time a very rare disease. At first, AIDS seemed primarily to be contracted by drug addicts and homosexuals, so it was considered a gay disease, but this was never true. AIDS is a growing threat to the heterosexual community as well as to the homosexual population. Close to 41,000 new cases of HIV infections are found every year. Then it was Ross Ann's turn to speak. Good evening, lines, lioness, judges, questioners, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. The topic that I have chosen to speak on tonight is are we safer under the new gun control law or under the old gun control law? I completed the Canadian Foreign Arms Safety Course in November of this past year, which took off half my long weekend and cost a fair amount of money. I thought it was strange to have to do a Foreign Arms Safety Course and not have to borrow a gun. By all means, I agree with safety, but what I learned by doing the course, I could have easily learned by going on. The, a few day course was not enough to learn any great extent of safety. The course was changed, so Canadian woods would become more safer. And so people with disabilities could apply on a party license if they would pass the course and then be able to go hunting and get their fair share of the game. I think this was a good idea, and people with disabilities should get their share of the game. So I think people hunting in the woods aren't as safe now as they were under the whole system, where hunters were required to play a shooting kiss in order to get their hunting permit. A young hunter now could be in for a real wake if he or she discharge some of these high power firearms in the woods without tax and had the target range for him. And speaker number five was Julia Benoit. Lines and lioness, ladies and gentlemen, fellow contestants, judges, good evening. I have chosen to discuss a topic that is not often talked about and is neither pleasant nor entertaining, the abuse of women worldwide. I wish to share with you some of the horrendous crimes, crimes that are justified because a man's honor is often at stake. Such barbaric acts as female genital mutilation, bra burnings, acid attacks, honor killings, and other forms of abuse are brutal, shocking, and naturally very unpleasant to hear about. However, to women in Middle East countries, they are a common occurrence. How, you might ask, can this be so in a civilized nation? Let's first talk about life for a woman in these nations. In most cases, women are the property of their male relatives, men of absolute rule. Many women are not allowed to leave their homes on their own. They are not allowed to work, go to school, or speak to other men in public. They have to cover themselves from head to toe. In these countries, a woman is killed every two hours by a male relative to protect the family's honor. And these killings are often supported by the society. No one protects the women, not their society, not their laws, not their religion, not even their own families. Women are blamed for everything. They are blamed for being raped, for wanting to be educated, for wanting to choose whom to marry, and for not being a virgin. The judges then had the very difficult task to pick the winners. Finally, the winners were announced. Third runner-up was Dana Pink. Second runner-up was Julia Billard. The winner of the Burgio Lines annual speak-off was Julia Benoit. Julia will now travel to Port of Basque on March the 19th to represent Burgio in the next level of the Speak Off. We congratulate all speakers on a fantastic job and we wish Julia the best of luck in the upcoming Speak Off. Stay tuned for more of This Week in Review coming up after this. They say if you want a wish to come true, never tell anyone. But there is one wish that can make the difference between life and death. 
And this wish can only come true if you tell someone. Please let your family know you want to be an organ donor. On Wednesday, several residents contacted our office to inform us about a boat that had sank at the Fisherman's Wharf. It appears this unfortunate incident happened sometime during Tuesday night. The boat belongs to Mr. Richard Strickland. This is his old boat and most of the fishing equipment was removed. Most of the gentlemen at the wharf agreed that a pipe must have come off of the boat for such a thing to have happened but it has not been confirmed. Mr. Strickland was out of town when this occurred. We spoke to Miss, Mrs. Christine Strickland on Thursday, and as of then, the boat hadn't been brought up, and they hoped to get her brought up sometime during the day to find out what caused the boat to sink. While we were at the Fisherman's Wharf on Wednesday, someone spotted a patched fox. It appeared the little fellow was quite frightened and not sure where to go. It is unusual for a fox to be fo so far away from his natural environment, or is it, since the coyote has moved in and coyotes will not tolerate foxes in their area. We have a few shots of the boat being hauled up, but as you can see, it took quite a bit of time. We will update you on what caused the boat to sink. We visited Cyril Bellard on Thursday of this week to take a look at some of his Andy work. Cyril Bellard, a former resident of Grand Brit and a former fisherman, passes his time building things. As you can see, being a fisherman has quite an impression on Cyril. He has crafted six dories, which takes him about two days. The dories are glued together and they have no nails. Cyril is hoping to sell these. This long liner was built last winter, as was this one. You may have seen this boat before. The Taverner has been on display at the Bellard Yard each summer. The construction of this boat took approximately one month. Each of these boats were made from two by fours cut into strips. This is Cyril's latest project, a replica of the Bellard's own. This project took about three weeks. When the roof is removed, you can see the details. For example, carpet on the floor, kitchen cabinets, coffee and end tables, and of course, the Chesterfield. On the outside, you can see the barbecue machine and the doghouse. There is also a light which can be turned on in the house. Cyril plans to display this piece on the lawn during the summer. Cyril has also crafted coffee tables, end tables, and an ent entertainment center for his home. A handcrafted oak chest is also on Cyril's list of woodworking accomplishments. We thank Cyril for a lot. On Thursday, March the 1st, we spoke to Lion Norm Strickland and Doreen Benoit about a program called The Lion Quiz. In our studio with us today, we have Norman Strickland and uh, Doreen Benoit, principal at the school, and they're going to be dis discussing a program called The Lion's Quiz. Now, Norm, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think Doreen will be in a better position for her to explain what Lion's Quiz is all about. 
Uh, but Lions Quiz has been around for quite some time now. It is founded by Lions Worldwide. Our district has been encouraging us to get involved for more than a year. There is quite an expense involved in this project, but we have decided to get involved and raise some money to get this project into our schools. Coordinator of Lions Quest, Nick White of Stephen Bell, he'll be down here to do a workshop and to train 36 teachers and support staff in April. It will be a two-day workshop, and the district think it is a great project for our school, and our local club here in Bridgeville think it's a great program for our school. In order to support this project, we have decided to have a coal plate take out on March the 11th. Our lawyers will be contacting everyone asking to order coal plates. Money raised in this project will go to this program. If we raise extra money, more than the program is going to cost, it will be used to purchase books for the students for Lions Quiz. Uh, we ask that you support this project when a lion calls. We would like to thank everyone for their past support to the Lions Club and thank you in advance for, for supporting this project. Okay. Uh, Doreen, you want to uh, tell us a little bit about what Lions Quiz is all about now? Well, uh, actually, we, we are somewhat involved in the Lions Quest program in our school right now. That's at the K-6 to level, and the reason for that is that uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we've had meetings with parents related to issues related to student behavior at our school. And one of the things that we were seeing is that children were not treating each other respectfully. And we were looking at uh, ways and means of dealing with the issue of respect for each other. And um, at that time, I contacted Nick White at the, uh, because the, there's, uh, there were schools in the district that were involved in respect days and things of that nature. And, at the, and he uh, encouraged me to come in to Stephenville, and myself and Milt actually, and Corwin Dumford at the high school level, uh, at two, two of the two-day training that, uh, mm -hmm. similar to the one you're talking about right now, for Lions Quest. So we did. And Melt and I looked at the materials. We thought that they were very worthwhile, and we thought that they would deal with the uh, goals that we had to improve the student behavior. So uh, actually, we, uh, I have this program here. This one's called Skills for Growing. There's a program called Skills for Growing for students from kindergarten to grade five level. And there's another program called Skills for Adolescents. That's for the grade six to eight level. And there's a third program that's called Skills for Action, which is for the senior high students. Now, I have never seen the Skills for Action program, but it's my understanding that program is a community service type program where students get involved in volunteering and things of that nature in their community. And we're very fortunate because we do have a lot of students in our schools now who are already involved in volunteering, which is wonderful. But the program, basically, the main focus of the program is to um, uh, involve, the, the good thing I like about this program is that it involves parents, students, the whole community is involved in the raising of good citizens in a drug-free society. One of the uh, things about the Lions Quest program, it began to uh, try to encourage healthy living and healthy relationships and uh, drug-free society. <coughs> so there's a lot of emphasis on the uh, drug-free aspect throughout the program. But uh, some of the areas that uh, we deal with are creating responsible citizens. We teach children the skills to become responsible. And that's something we expect people to become responsible. But in this program, you teach them how to become responsible. You go through uh, skits and uh, discussion groups the same way you would have uh, conferences and meetings on how to build a good community, that's how these, these, this program is set up and, and little children are learning appropriate skills for dealing with uh, issues related to uh, conflict, for instance. If you get in conflict, how are you going to deal with it? What, how are you going to solve your problem? And there's uh, excellent uh, ways and means of doing it. It's a very interactive program. Our health program deals with a lot of these things. But it doesn't do the job that the Lions Quest program does because the, this is a um, highly interactive program. You, you discuss the, is, the issue, say, in, related to how to get along in your group. Then you uh, 
go through the process of practicing that skill, and afterwards you analyze it. Now, how did we how did we do there? Are, are we uh, listening well to each other? For example, at the grade uh, four, five, three, four, five level now, the area that I'm working on is listening skills. Now, if you look in any group, adults or children, listening is not something that we do very well. I'm as guilty as the next person. But in this program, what we do, we, we teach our children ways to listen to each other. Then they practice. All, they'll get up and tell stories to each other. The other person's practicing. How, how do we do that? We use good gestures. We nod. We ask them questions, show that we're interested in them. And it promotes a caring attitude. Now, the thing about this, it doesn't just happen. You teach those skills for a while. But if you're doing it as a whole school and as, as a whole community and everybody is buying into it, the chance that <coughs> this is going to make our community a better place is certainly there. Like uh, self-esteem is an issue among a lot of children. There's a whole uh, unit on self-esteem and building your self-confidence. That's skills they learn to do that, you know, and dealing with your emotions, those types of things. They're, there is a course at the high school level that's, um, that does deal with this to a certain degree. It's called uh, Adolescence. But the Lions Quest program, in my opinion, is far better than the Adolescence program that's in place at the high school level right now. Uh, we've uh, decided uh, at our school that uh, we would uh, use the Lions Quest program in conjunction with the health program. And uh, we, we take three periods per cycle and teach the skills from the Lions Quest program right now. This is the only, only one we have. We only have the grade five section, so we, we uh, use that. But there is, there is a program, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five. It's done so neatly. It's all in little packages, and you take, this is, this is your unit for this. And it's so teacher-friendly and user-friendly. One good part of it, this is the... Uh, parent. This one is called the Family Connection. This is uh, a guide to leading parent meetings. Actually, uh, this program, if we're going to do it wholeheartedly, which we haven't, we're not doing it wholeheartedly it's at this point in time. We haven't involved the parents because this is the first year that we've, mm -hmm. we've been using it. We're trying to get, uh, get a feel for it ourselves, but um, hopefully next year we'll be involving the parents and there's, yeah, four meetings per year you schedule with parents and then the parents set up teams and things. It can be a wonderful program for the whole community is my, uh, my feeling. Now the uh, Lion's Quest, is it, um, is it a, totally pro uh, to a program totally uh, dealing with uh, drug issues? No, there's not, actually there is, there's one unit in there that's called, called Growing Up Drug Free. Um, and, and but it's, it's helping build self, self-esteem, self-confidence, and uh, managing your all the things that contribute to drug problems. Okay. Like they de they deal with helping you develop okay. skills so that you deal don't come to the point where you're going to be using drugs because you're having those other problems. Okay. Now, is this going to be? You already said that you're doing it uh, on so many days cycle now. So this you're hoping that is going to be a full-fledged course, I'll call it, or subject in school, if you want to call it that, um, in, in the elementary grades. What about the high school grades now? At this point in time, uh, the high school teachers, we had a meeting this week, uh, a joint staff meeting, and the Lions Quest program was discussed with the high school teachers. They had some questions related to it, and Mr. Linehan has uh, discussed the, the questions that they've had with uh, Nick White, the mm -hmm. coordinator. And uh, I'm, he'll take that back to the staff and discuss it with them. This is not something where anybody's being forced into anything, to a program. Uh, personally, would I like to see everybody involved? I certainly would because I think that that's how things work. You get things work by having the whole community and the whole schools involved. And, uh, and the more people who buy into something and work with it, the, the quicker the change will take place and the more it will become part of uh, what you do. Okay, so right now you're talking on uh, A.J. Matthews Elementary School level Yes. for those kids. Um, now you talked that it was a, a community uh, program. How can the community, like 
say for me, for example, uh, or someone who doesn't have kids in school, how can we become involved? What, what do we do? Well, actually, I, I was just showing you the yep. Family Connection book. That's one aspect of it. You would have public meetings, obviously, uh, whether you have them on, uh, at grade levels, you know, for kindergarten to grade three parents, and then it would depend on how you, there are a number of different ways of implementing the program. And that's just one way is having a whole group public meeting and invite people to come. Now, obviously, everybody don't don't come. Wow. But you you take you get a few at a time and you move from there. It's like the snack program we have in the school now. When we started the snack program last year, there were not a lot of people in the beginning that appeared to be supporting it. Mm -hmm. And right now, we have a good uh, volunteer basis, and we have a lot of. Uh, support from the community as a whole. So uh, so I think you have to, it, it's, it's like anything, you have to see that it's working and to see that, that something good is coming from it before you accept it. So I can't, I don't see that this is something that everybody's going to say, oh, what a wonderful mm -hmm. thing you're doing at school right away. I think they have to see some positive results. And they have to hear their children say that, oh, I like that program. I went into the grade six classroom last uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Mr. Vatcher was out at the time, and the substitute was in, and the substitute did, wasn't really familiar with the Lions mm -hmm. Quest program. So that afternoon, the they did math instead of their Lions Quest. They were very upset that they weren't having their Lions Quest that day. And so so they, that's a good sign. So they know that, and they know the name of it that oh, is yes. called the Lions oh, Quest. Yes. Okay, so it's interesting. In fact, I've heard uh, some of the parents speak about their kids that's involved into the Lions Quest, and they're really enjoying it very well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah. There's another little part that the parents, you know, like I said, we're, we're just uh, implementing it this year, but there's another aspect of the uh, kindergarten level. I'm just looking at it. It's called Together Times. It's a little workbook that uh, parents and children work together with at home. Now, okay, so it's just like a little magazine, and for this one, is I'm po making positive decisions. Like they, there's a little activity. Okay, they, the children and the parents discuss the booklet. Like you'd, okay. you'd set it, you'd set it for homework. Say the same as you would any other subject, okay. and but but it's for the parents and the children to do together. Okay. So it's all uh, right. Yeah. Sounds so great. you've already so you've already started. Oh yes. Yeah, and uh, so this one that the Lions Club is raising money for is to uh, bring it on stream in full well, force. We've got 36 people for the train right now. Okay. And I believe eventually that there's going to be some parents can be trained if they want. Yeah. Somewhere down the road. Okay. Okay, but this is the first thing. It's going to cost us money for to get those people in there for a two-day workshop and get them trained. And if there, we raise more money. Then there's going to be a material like books and that for the program. That extra money will go for the books. Well, now in my discussion with uh, the high school principal, he, he did, and he had been talking to uh, Nick White. Now this mm -hmm. is, is uh, since you've been talking to him. Okay. Uh, it's my understanding that it's quite possible that the training may not go in April okay. a, as was intent, intended originally, because uh, like. Everybody needs to feel that they're sure. ready for it before it starts. And sometimes September is a better time to start than than April if, mm -hmm. if we were going to, like, in terms of training, because, like, you need to start working with something immediately once you're trained, rather than be trained now and then implement it for September. You've forgotten sure. things and that. So, so uh, that was uh, part of the discussion that I've had with the high school principal since. So I really don't know exactly that it will be April, but it's certainly... Uh, our, our students, certainly at the grade K to six level, have been very interested in training for the last year and a half. So, so we're ready You're to roll right. with it. We've yeah. been familiarized with it, but now, of course, well, everybody has. We do the same thing. We really want to be in a financial position yeah, sure. for the for the Hamlet when the time comes when they want to come down here. Uh, the last time I talked with Nick, would you talked with sometime eight or May, early May, right? Yeah. No, like you say, that could be put off sometime. Yes, it could. It may not be early May or anything. Uh, it may not be. Until so we could be looking at September. It could be September as okay. opposed to uh, spring, but uh, but it's certainly a program that we are. So in you guys of uh, the elementary school uh, teachers are also uh, are familiar with some of the aspects of it, and it is a wor in working pro pro progress in their curriculum. Yes. So it is an integral part of their curriculum. Yeah. The only the only thing about the program 
uh, now is that Milt and I are the only two people who are trained okay. at, the, at our level. And uh, it's much, it works much better if the teacher is the person who's trained and the teacher is the person who's going in and uh, sure. working with the program. Yeah, because probably uh, a program like this, it can be, a, uh, although you've got time set aside for it, but during the day you could probably have uh, oodles of uh, opportunities to that's, focus on that's that. The idea. So it was a hand going thing. Oh, it was, very, it was a very interesting program. Uh, well, anything else you'd like to add? Or? No, I like. Personally speaking, I support the program wholly and feel that it's uh, uh, well worth having in our community. Actually, Lions Quest has conflict management management programs as well as that you know, like uh, that we haven't been involved in, but some schools in the district are. And I suppose if we had a lot of children, at one point in time, we used to have a lot of conflict among our children, say, on the playground, and maybe because of the change in the school environment this year, there's no playground. Children are separated somewhat more, so there's some changes. And we haven't had to deal with as many fights as we have in past years. But uh, there are programs for working with small groups of children and, uh, you know, that are specific groups. So, so, so it's, it's certainly a wide, uh, wide range program dealing with uh, a lot of issues. Yeah. And this program is, is an international program. This is not just uh, a Newfoundland program, not just a Canadian program, but an international program that's been endorsed by the Lions International, right? Yeah. In fact, uh, I think uh, the video what we're going to show is certainly deals with internationally. Yes, it does. Okay, now the fundraiser that you're having on March the 11th is a cold plate takeout, and your and your members, excuse me, <coughs> will be calling individuals in the community right. for asking for their support. That's right. To go towards this program. That's ex every cent what we raise will go to go to this program. Okay. Now, as Norm said, we do have a video for you um, to watch uh, a little bit more information about the Lions Quest. Around the world. The inherent nature of childhood ignores national boundaries and is remarkably similar from country to country. From the start, children begin life curious about the world, actively involved, eager to learn. And that's good, because universally, the hope of every nation is its children. boundaries when adults talk about what they want for young people there is remarkable agreement they want children to grow up to be responsible productive citizens people with good values who can form close ties to their families and communities but how does that happen in the early 1900s when most children lived and worked closely with their parents grandparents and other adults there were many opportunities for children to learn important life skills and to feel positively connected to the people around them but the nature of childhood has changed dramatically in the last hundred years. In today's world, the pressures of a rapidly changing society are taking their toll on families. Families have less time, and traditional networks of support are often absent. Children are bombarded with messages from the mass media, and tempted at earlier and earlier ages to experiment with negative behaviors that are both dangerous and harmful. Here in Turku, Finland, with a climate fit only for the hardy, outward appearances could lead one to believe that a healthy lifestyle automatically comes with the territory. But here, like anywhere else in the world, people who work with children know that preventing problem behaviors requires long-term comprehensive efforts in which family, school, and community members work together in support of children's healthy development. Working to prevent problems before they start, Lions Clubs International, the world's largest service club organization, and Quest International, a nonprofit educational association, developed the Lions Quest program. The goal of the program is to foster essential life and citizenship skills, teaching responsibility, good judgment, self-discipline, and respect for others, preparing children for the responsibilities of family life, citizenship, and employment in the 21st century. The Lions Quest program offers educators a spirited, activity-packed school course curriculum 
that interactively teaches skills and develops values that encourage children to be the best they can be. The Lions Quest program is divided into three distinct programs with age-appropriate materials and activities designed to meet the needs of children of different ages. The Lions Quest Skills for Growing program was developed to reach children in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. The Skills for Adolescents for use in middle and junior high school and the Skills for Action aimed at teenagers 14 to 19 years old. In order to make the Lions Quest curriculum available to schools, major financial support for the Lions Quest program is provided by Lions Clubs as a part of the Lions' long-term commitment to drug education and awareness. Typically, Lions Clubs will provide funding for class materials and teacher training. Here in Turku, the Aurora Lions Club subsidized the cost of a Lions Quest training seminar for teacher Hannah Marbury. At the Turku Primary School, Hannah teaches the Lions Quest classes at all grade levels. Today, the children in the Skills for Growing program are setting out on a trip to the local kindergarten. In class, they've been working with the Lions Quest mascot, Quentin T. Bear, learning about empathy. Today, they'll have a chance to practice some of the skills they've been talking about. Experiences like this help both the older and younger children. The older children gain a sense of self-confidence. The younger children feel valued as the older students take the time to give the little ones some individual attention. For all the children, it's a win-win situation. By building a child's sense of self-esteem, a protective climate is formed, one that inhibits problem behaviors. In activities like these, children learn emotional and social competencies, such as communication, decision-making, and assertiveness skills. Skills they will need to help prevent problem behaviors from developing. In the next few years, these children will be faced with choices that will affect their entire lives. Statistics show that as early as grade four, many children feel the pressure to use drugs. The average age children begin using drugs is about 12 or 13. But there are solutions. Drug prevention efforts can work. The Lions Quest program supports all students in growing up healthy and drug-free by combining prevention strategies with positive youth development skills in a caring, consistent environment. When children understand the harm of drug use, and perceive that their family and friends disapprove of its use, their risk of developing problem behaviors is significantly reduced. Working with sixth graders, teacher Hannah Marbury is using the Skills for Adolescents program. Today, representatives from the community, a law enforcement officer, and several customs agents are in Hannah's classroom to teach a class on drug prevention. Of special interest to the students is the live demonstration by a local customs agent and his black Labrador retriever, Iru. Iru is an enthusiastic and very successful investigator when it comes to assisting in drug searches at the Turku ports. The classroom demonstration of Iru's skills is a unique and novel way of presenting drug abuse prevention information. The discussions that precede and follow the demonstration effectively set clear standards for positive behaviors and establish strong norms against drug use. In classes like these, under the leadership of a Lions Quest teacher, young people become aware of the challenges their early adolescent years will present, and they have an opportunity to develop the skills necessary to resist negative peer pressures. From research, we know that building resiliency in young people, making them more capable and competent, is the key to helping them resist negative influences. But how is that best accomplished? Even here in the Caribbean, where fortunate world travelers seek a vacation in what seems like paradise, society struggles with the challenge of finding ways to keep healthy children on track. Nearly 20 years ago, educators at the George Hicks Junior High School in the Cayman Islands became aware of a serious drug problem on the island, one that seemed to be getting out of hand. Early on, they decided to do something in the way of prevention. Adora Bowden Groom, principal of George Hicks Junior High School, explains. Um, I'm sure any child in the school knows somebody who has been using drugs or who uses drugs or alcohol, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. So it must affect them, whether it's in their homes or in the extended family or with friends, because it is a small community. With regards to this school, we try to do as much in terms of prevention as we can, and I think that's perhaps one of the reasons we use the Quest program. It's not the only reason. 
In a Lion's Quest class, you won't find children seated in rows with a teacher lecturing at the head of the class. In these classes, children are developing life skills, learning to take responsibility, experiencing decision-making, gaining self-confidence. The goal here is to make children feel safe and valued as they contribute ideas or speak out. When given a task, children work in small groups and become responsible for their own goal setting. In this non-traditional classroom, the teacher takes on the role of facilitator. Today, in Sue Tresseter's class, the students are applying critical thinking skills as they develop a plan of action for their service learning project. They've decided to do a beach cleanup project. Now they've got to figure out what it will take to make the project a success. The total success of a Lion's Quest program like the one here in Cayman depends on the support, encouragement, and active participation of Lions Club members. For the beach cleanup project planned by Sue's class, the local Lions Club will provide transportation and all the supplies needed to do the project, as well as a helping hand with the labor. Andrew Eden, chairman of the Lions Quest program in Cayman, describes the project. One of our natural resources on the island here is our beaches. And uh, from time to time, like everywhere else, uh, things get a, a bit polluted. So you're going to have the school kids out there cleaning up the place and uh, erecting signs, asking people to keep the place clean, you know. In Cayman, the support of the local Lions Club extends beyond this single service learning project. Over the 15-plus uh, the years we've, we've been doing this, we put uh, approximately uh, $20,000 per year into this program which includes uh, workshop trainers for the, uh, the teachers to teach the Lion Skills program in the schools, also all the, the uh, materials that's required for these projects, to bring in trainers to train our teachers. And uh, by doing all of this, it uh, encourages kids to uh, you know, have a drug-free and happy lifestyle away from the, uh, the bad things in life. With the program focused on helping kids be the best they can be, and supporting efforts to keep them drug-free, the program embraces both long-term and short-term goals. Sue Tresseter, Lions Quest trainer teacher, explains. I think this um, program has a real benefit for our community, and in the very short term, children are going out to clean up a beach, and that has to be good. In the long term, what we're hoping it's doing is producing some model citizens some young Lions Club members, some children who are going to become adults who are civic-minded, who have a sense of pride about their country and about their community and the skills to do something about it. Our hope is that for these children who are involved in this Lions Quest program here on the island is that they will develop the character, the pride, not only in themselves but also in their community, that they will continue to stay off drugs. Certainly no one wants to see a good kid go bad. Building the self-esteem of a young person can help to keep them on the right track. In the United States, in the rural farm country of Malta, Illinois, the local high school is using a powerful tool to help build the self-esteem of young people, the Lions Quest Skills for Action program. This program is designed to give 14 to 19 year old students a chance to develop character, responsibility, and skills for successful citizenship and employment. Today, John Mason's Lions Quest class is preparing for a trip to the local retirement home, where they will volunteer their time playing bingo with the senior citizens and serving refreshments they've made. But the program involves more than simply volunteering. Students are asked to analyze their experiences, underscoring the benefits of service both for the student and for the people who are served. Reflection leads students to ask themselves these questions. What did I do? What did it mean to me? And how do I feel about it? Now what will I do? Student Mark Madsen considers his experience. I was kind of like an anti-socialist before I came into this a couple of years ago. And now I can give back to the community and feel good about myself. And giving back is the best part of the whole experience. When you feel good about yourself and good at what you've done, that's the best part. Strengthening and empowering youth is the goal of service learning, a potent educational tool that gives students a chance to apply skills and gain knowledge in real-life settings. In the classroom, students identify their skills and interests 
and target problems they wish to solve. In the field, they put the theory to work. Then they return to the classroom to reflect on what they have done and analyze what they have learned. Service learning is based on the belief that education must be linked to social responsibility, and the most effective learning takes place when it is active and experiential. Student Michelle Bernard reflects upon her experience. It's helped me a lot with my people skills. I know that um, it's helped me just to kind of relax and work. I can work with anybody. Before I was a lot more shy to work in groups and I wouldn't really talk a lot when we had group work. But now I just voice what I have to say and I like it better. I mean, it helped me to work with more people. At the heart of the Lions Quest program is the belief that young people are resources who can make a positive difference in the world. But setting theory aside for a moment, how do the people involved in the Lions Quest program feel about it? As a 36-year veteran educator, um, it's the most exciting and rewarding program I've ever been associated with. It's a good experience. You get, it's good for job experience, it's good for people experience. You feel good about yourself. It's just an all-around great class. I have fun every time I come here. One of the things that I really like about Lions Quest is that it gives everybody in the classroom an opportunity to emerge as a leader. The main thing, you know, my aim is to uh, try to get it spread throughout the Caribbean. I would strongly recommend to start this uh, Lions Quest program in your community. It's fun for the students and it's probably fun for the teacher. I know Mr. Mason has fun. I think Lions Quest program, it is the best youth activity we ever have had. I'd say go for it. Stay with us for Off the Right, the community events, and the BBS Playbill, all after this. After you've seen the whales and the icebergs and the fjords, come witness a natural wonder. A Saturday night, St. John's, Newfoundland. Imagine that. Off the rack. This week as we scanned our tape rack, we came across a tape of the Lion Skidoo trip to Grand Brit. Let's look back to March 1991. It seemed like we'd just left the mine a few minutes ago, but uh, now we're all parking on the pond near the church in Grand Brit. And when everyone gets there now, we'll be going down to the school where we'll be uh, having our lunch. Good evening and welcome to the community events segment of tonight's broadcast. I'm Jennifer Marx. The St. John's Central High School will host TV Bingo on Wednesday, March 7th at 7 p.m. There will be one game for $300. Cards are a dollar each or six for five dollars and are available from any students attending St. John's Central High and are in most stores around town. Please support our students and play TV Bingo. The Virgil Grand Search and Rescue are planning a skidoo trip to Grand Brit for the public for March 17th. If you would like to have a sponsor sheet, please pick one up from any member of the Grand Search and Rescue team or at their building. The ACW have rescheduled their Wednesday night cards to Saturday nights during Lent. The next scheduled card game is for Saturday, March 10th. Come along and bring a friend. The A.J. Matthews Elementary School would like to have copies of the following books. Mercer Mayer series, Franklin series, R.L. Stein novels, Babysitter's Club novels, and Berenstein Bear series. If you have any of these books at home and no longer use them, we would appreciate your donation. 
The Employment Outreach Office would like to avoid, advise that Student Work and Services Program, SWAS, applications are now available at the Outreach Office. Deadlines for applications is March 30th, 2001. The Bridger Alliance Club will be having a cold plate takeout on Sunday, March 11th to help financially support Alliance Quest program for the A.J. Matthews School. Cold plates cost $3.50 each. If you would like to support this program, please order a cold plate from the Alliance members when they call. If your group or organization has an upcoming event plan, we will be happy to advertise it for you. Just call the BBS office by Wednesdays of each week to have items included in this portion of our broadcast. That concludes the community event segment of tonight's broadcast. See you next week. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday for a rebroadcast of Pansy's Garden. Try your luck on Wednesday by playing iSchool TV Bingo. Tune in on Thursday when we'll have a rebroadcast of the bandwagon. Join Pans and the Gang for two stories, a craft, and lots of fun on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on Pansy's Garden. And I'll be here again next week with This Week in Review. Please stay tuned now for the bandwagon. For This Week in Review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night and God bless.